Um, may I welcome uh, everyone to this uh, discussion, which looks at four specific elements that connect with China's domestic governance. Now, mind you, domestic governance is a, is a vast subject. Uh, we can split it into uh, hundreds of themes. Um, we will tackle four, but in an expectation that maybe this is a theme that can continue for much longer. Uh, Ravi Butalingam, who uh, has uh, a sense of history and uh, uh, looks up old material, uh, told me that, in fact, from the very early days of the Institute, from its um, foundation virtually, an examination of China's domestic governance was a priority at the Institute. So I think it's very, very fitting that we are able uh, to um, focus on this. We will go straight to the four presentations that will be made, starting with Ritu, then Bhim, then Ravi. Each of them will speak for 10 minutes. And I will then make uh, brief comments about uh, leading small groups, which is my theme, for about five or six minutes. And uh, we will then have a conversation among ourselves, hopefully, for just um, 10 minutes or so, 10, 12 minutes. And then we will open the floor for conversation. Uh, I'm delighted that we have, at this point, 55 participants. So without any further ado, uh, may I invite Ritu, please, to um, make her uh, uh, initial presentation. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, sir. And thank you, ICS, for you know, st starting with this such an important issue, domestic governance. Um, I was thinking, you know, with, with what, I mean, what is something which is so uh, motivating to begin with? And I came across a news event in Xinhua, uh, which says that uh, Xi Jinping in 2015 uh, met the county party secretaries, uh, you know, in, in one of the training session. And uh, he gave a speech on, you know, uh, Xi Jinping to a Xianwai Shuji, uh, what is the new demands of Xi Jinping towards the county party secretaries? So I found it very fascinating, you know, when I came across this news even in 2000, which was happened in 2015, when he was addressing a training session for the county party secretary in one of the party school, since one of the, you know, the topic of the discussion also, how party school actually uh, formulate and play an important role in formulating the policies of the governance at various level. And I would say this county became a very important issue in that sense. Uh, because it is some of the very one of the very important small administrative unit uh, where actually one can have a face to face relationship with top leaders, bureaucrats and the ordinary citizens. So it's a kind of an interface of a state and society where you will see that how a state has been trying to govern the society, administer it, transform it, and you will see a kind of a you know, the problems which coming from society itself, and they try to make demands and influence the state as such. So in that case, you know, the proper interaction which you get to see between the state and society in China, county is the very smallest administrative unit, which actually gives us a very interesting field of inquiry. So if one really want to understand, I would say Chinese politics, I think county is a very important, you know, administrative, uh, unit of governance to begin with, and which has been continue, continuing from the imperial system as well. Now, to go on to further on this argument, uh, it is a kind of a, you know, a microcosm in which you will also see a kind of a, you know, the dynamism of economic growth and dilemmas. So it has both, you know, the dynamism in the sense of uh, infrastructure development, commercial development, uh, agrarian transformation, as well as dilemmas, for example, the challenges it is going to face in terms of land use patterns or industrial development, as well as sustainable development. So it's a kind of, you know, a very interesting, a complex mix of dynamism and dilemma of economic growth per se. 
and this is a you know a very interesting unit where you will see a kind of a you know um, a complex set of situation between industry and agriculture urban and rural rich and poor communities so you see a very interesting phase of politics and development especially in this particular administrative area now before i go on to explain this uh, you know i just want to look at now the transformation of the county governors from the last few years especially from 1980s or so after the reforms and one interesting point to look at the county governance has been that you know it has the work of the county especially it has become more intense specialized uh, in and uh, you know detailed and techno technologically uh, or you can say technically sorry technically sophisticated and demanding itself so which means that uh, you know the kind of uh, uh, activities which used to perform earlier and the kind of task and responsibilities which has been given to the county governance has been widened in its scope and its character for example you know i have uh, come across this kind of a uh, important bureaus and in, and uh, uh, departments for example earlier one used to have only uh, finance and tax tax bureaus transportation education public health uh, bureaus which has now been extended to you know forestry animal husbandry bureaus family planning commission foreign affairs bureau public security earthquake offices land management bureau public sanitation real estate management tobacco you know regional uh, development so it has widened its uh, scope as well as become more specialized in terms of managing the affairs of the economic development in particular locality i have said that the second point which i want to uh, say the county is a very interesting mix of uh, developmental state entrepreneurial growth and socialist having maintained a socialist tendencies in it now what i'm trying to say with this if you look at the uh, the county administration uh, county has to manage is a kind of mid section between the uh, province and the village so you have the province at the above and the township and the town and the village at the lower level so it is basically and then you have the central chungyang changpu which is at the central level so it is basically led to a kind of a management of a vertical level uh, administration as well as the horizontal level of administration and bureaus so in that case I may, if i may interrupt a county is very comparable to a district is it not Yes, and I mean, how many counties are there in the whole of China? There are many, sir. At least you know one province itself. Depend. I'll I'll come to it. Wait, uh, you know, because county is not turning to cities. So I'll uh, I will also come to that. So in that sense, it is actually trying to comply with the nationalist, sorry, the national policies and guidelines which have been given from the top, and from the provincial level, they try to adjust. with the demands as well as the expectation of the provincial level government and at the local level at the horizontal level they try to manage a kind of a coordination among and the between the various bureaus and the administration so it has a lot of you know uh, kind of a specialized skill as well as the integration and the administrative management work which actually it has to perform as a centralist and the localist kind of a you know important platform for governance so which means that uh, and which actually gives it a kind of a you know enough pressure as well as flexibilities so pressure in the sense because it has to follow the policy implementation of the central level so which means that if you really want to see the enthusiasm of the policy implementation one can actually look at the county level you know the enthusiasm of the policy implementation of the national level and that particularly we have seen in the poverty alleviation program of china in a significant way i'll come to it later and then uh, you know the uh, so, so and then a kind of a flexibility in terms of interpreting interpreting those policies in the sense when you implement it you have still have a freedom to implement it so you have a flexibility which county government can enjoy if they are able to make a kind of a coordination among the various bureaus and offices at the horizontal level and with the provincial level they are able to make a kind of a a coordination with the provincial level bureaus as well now there is a point of uh, you know uh, problem as well in the sense that sometime the centralist tendencies uh, will pressurize them and then it constrain them into the actual functioning of the 
policy implementation. So this is a wider debate that how much autonomy county government enjoys, how much flexibility it has been given to them, how much constraint on them in terms of a policy implementation. But thing is that since they have been giving so much of you know, flexibilities, which gives them an idea of a creative financing. Now, what is the idea of a creative financing? Most of the kind of county governments in, I would say most part of China are actually busy building the industrial park, agrarian park, agro-industrial park, scientific and technological development zones. So all that gives a kind of a, you know, idea of flexibility of using, uh, you know, different kind of resources they have in their hand and also able to manage the resources, which is given by the central and the provincial level. Yeah, so I'll, it, yes, I will like that, to, uh, yeah, I will like to, uh, which I was, you know, uh, thinking, just give me one second, because, you know, there are some photographs to show what I'm saying so that one can relate to it and I can take it up uh, in the discussions uh, later. So the point which I will say that there is a kind of a taxes which has been added into the, so there's a whole question of, as everybody can see those photos? We can't. Oh, you have to can't. share your screen, Ritu. Yeah. So that's what I was doing. Uh, yeah. Maybe if I... Uh, yes. Okay. So I think... Uh, yeah. Here. Yes. So what I'm going back to, uh, you know, some of the county, uh, of course, Changkung, which I visited. So I just want to give you this entire resources of, they have put in the market. This is, you know, flower market that they have done. Then look at this industrial park they're trying to create uh, with, you know, with a lot of urban restructuring planning. Then this is a complete layout of their you know, industrial, agro-industrial base, which they are trying to create in this Changkung area. And this is the kind of a flower market and the kind of you know, mechanization as well as expansion of the scope they have done in this. So I'm just slowly, you know, uh, and urban restructuring. So which means that county doesn't remain rural, rather it actually try to widen the scope in having an urban orientation. So which means that it create, it try to restructure the state power by you know going out of the territorial boundaries, which have been created by the uh, by the state uh, as such. Uh, yeah, just one second. Time is up. I'm yes. Afraid. So just you know, I want to show you the. This is a rural market. The agrarian market. So it has both rural and the urban. And this is a informal kind of a commerce development. Yeah, this is I wanted to show the administrative building of the county government. Okay, Ritu, can we wind up now, please? Yeah, last this is one minute. Your, uh, party school. And the last slide. This is a training session for the various party cadres. Okay, so I stop here. Okay, I'm sorry, it came to a slightly abrupt end, but um, we will pursue it in conversation, I presume. Uh, Beam, would you like to please come in? Yes, uh, can you hear me, sir? Yeah, yes. good, uh, yeah good afternoon, uh, everyone here. And I would like to thank Ambassador Rana here yeah, for taking this initiative and really uh, sharing your thoughts and provo provoking, in fact, me to really work on this. And in fact, uh, and even to the Institute of Chinese Studies and especially Professor Mohanty here, yeah, who is actually also in the audience, uh, for really actually, uh, you know, I would say provoking, in fact, uh, because I'm working on this paper for a uh, for a special issue for the nine uh, sorry for the you know hundredth anniversary CP of the Communist Party of China. How Kada uh, is being defined in China? So it's like the paper a tentative title was like is. Uh, construction and reconstructions of Kada in China, in today, in ch changing China. However, uh, the, the today's presentation is in the domain of the governance. And uh, although I'll be speaking a little bit on that part of it, but definitely we'll explore how uh, the Kada 
appointment and selections and certain rules have been initiated by uh, the regime under Xi Jinping to really reorient how uh, with changing ideology, the, the selection of cadres has changed in China. So uh, I think uh, I would thank uh, Professor uh, yeah, uh, Ritu Agarwal for the last slide when she showed cadre training school in China. So actually having said that, uh, you know, today is the right time to discuss on how uh, domestic governance in China is about. And firstly, if I have to really see today uh, with 91 plus million uh, members of the Communist Party. So there is always, uh, uh, not to this audience, but to the general audience, do all the Communist Party members are the cadres of the Communist Party. So many a time it becomes, uh, you know, it becomes quite a, novi uh, you know, a challenging to uh, address many of the students, young folks here. Uh, at the same time, like if you have to really see uh, of the 91 million uh, members in, in, in Communist China, sorry, of the Communist Party of China. So how is China being ruled? Are all these people ruling China? In fact, no. But some of the studies that I've really worked are, are referring to looking into some of these uh, party documents and as well as some of the researches done by different scholars in uh, different uh, provinces, I, we, there's a rough idea that there is almost like 41 to 42 million cadres in China. Out of that, almost like more than 50% are not CPC members. So having said that, so not all cadres, ruling cadres of China are Communist Party members. So at least, and I remember that when Professor Eric uh, Broskard made a presentation in one of these uh, Giridashinka Memorial Lecture at IIC. I do remember he pointing out to that. So uh, also alluding to his uh, lecture and uh, some of the readings that I've done in the past uh, couple of years, uh, uh, it says that, you know, today uh, we see the development of CADA or the definition of CADA is changed a lot. Now, how do we see that? In 1991 onwards, uh, sorry, 93 onwards, especially when we see uh, the definition of cadres has completely changed. It, it is said that the leading cadres and the non-leading cadres. So who are these leading cadres and who, who constitute those leading cadres? And who are the non-leading cadres? So again, going to some of these definitions that really help, you know, gives us a, a rough estimate or, you know, it helps us to really understand who are these who is who of China today? Are, do they, are they all non-leading cadres or are they just the leading cadres? So many of the debates today are the reports that uh, you know, is available online also by various scholars having put that. They said that there are almost like, uh, 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 almost like 2 million at least leading cadres. Out of 2 million at least, some of the core leaders are more than 5,000, uh, you know, more than five lakhs, like, oh, sorry, so to say more, at least six lakhs and above. So, so these are some of the leading cadres who can be tomorrow's, uh, uh, so to say, uh, party secretaries or, or leading cadres, not only at the central level, but also at different levels of governance in China, administrative governance in China. So, at the, you know, at the eve of this uh, 100 party, uh, you know, 100, you know, uh, parties centenary, it becomes so apt to really understand uh, how are these. Today, in, in Xi Jinping's, uh, 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 you know, regime now, or the, so to say the new era, we see uh, the acceptance rate of membership also, not only of the cadres, but membership also is much harder than getting a seat in one of some of those Ivy Leagues in United States. So it is less than even a nine to, uh, you know, less than 9%. Like universities like Cornell have an acceptance rate of more than 11% every year for the last uh, five years or so. But under Xi Jinping, it has become increasingly difficult now. Now, how are these cadres recruited now? It has, so many of them say that, okay, the Communist Youth League was one of the transmission belt, so to say the pool where they could, uh, you know, recruit cadres. But at the same time today, when I interact with some of my friends who are today uh, uh, 
uh, some of the cadres in different levels of uh, you know institutions there we see that they are not they are not the members of the communist youth league but they are some of those reserves or so to say university graduates who are being uh, recruited from university graduates and trying to be uh, recruited in some of these provincial governments yeah so we see that and now what are their role today now what are their roles have you know if we look into look from the you know from the inception on what especially in the Xi Jinping period the, the previous and in the Xi Jinping period we see that um, the Qada today is definitely the agent of governance but they are not only the agents of government but they are also the the agents of political communication and as well as political control by default so although if you move above like if you are even a non party uh, cadre but higher the higher the h loan or higher, higher the levels you move or you get promoted one gets promoted definitely uh, he or she or that cadre is uh, affiliated or becomes the member of the communist party by default so so having said that so to move further, again you see like uh, you know this, uh, uh, how this communist party uh, so has defined uh, uh, you know uh, the role of carter today as i said that he's not only like uh, not only an agent but also as a tool of communication and control but also a tool of social transformation there and political transformation there and and uh, if we look to see how in different uh, leadership uh, different regimes or under whether it's xi jinping hu jinping you see the missions of these cadres also being shaped accordingly now if we see especially in xi jinping's period we see the mission of the party is the national rejuvenation but what is the role of the cadre person here yeah. his role or her role here is that two minutes now beam thank you uh, the role of the communist party here or uh, of the cadre here is the cadre has to be has to be a politically uh, more oriented rather than competence here yeah. it is the political loyalty political performance not just economic performance here yeah. so it is more of political loyalty and political performance here yeah. and if and similarly if you go back to mao stand you even see here it's the political quality that matters more than other competence but tang uh, chang and who spirit you see balance of both competence and political loyalty is playing uh, a middle ground approach but whereas under xi jinping we uh, we see that cadre is relatively being political uh, politicalized i would say or has been uh, a political animal so yeah, so so what are the implications if i have to say yeah. so uh, some of the impl implications definitely it re really resonates the literature or the research really resonates what uh, we see during mao period uh, that is politics and command and at the same time we see uh, you know the departure of the norms of the 1980s i think this audience definitely know, knows that know that and is how do you define today's uh, you know performance are you talking about performance on the basis of economic merit you know merits or are you talking about political merits definitely under xi jin being spirit it is political merit than economic merit and uh, and some of the recent actually uh, research uh, Uh, which i've read around shows that definitely it is the politics in command that has come to i think i'll uh, rest here and I'll look forward to the discussion thank you sir thank you very much beam for sticking to the time you will see friends that both ritu and beam have given us a rich panorama of um, uh, the subjects that they have focused on county administration and cadres and little bit of conversation about the um, uh, training of cadres i think beam may perhaps develop this further in conversation uh, we now turn to ravi who will talk about the management of science and technology issues uh, to you ravi thank you kishan and uh, thank you to ics well this question of china's governance of science and technology is probably the most crucial 
for China today because it holds the answer to a larger question. Can China become rich before it becomes old? If that is to happen, China's productivity has to increase by leaps and bounds. And if that is to happen, it can only be based on innovation, uh, based on science and technology. So that is why this question is crucial. Now, just for a short while, two, three minutes, what does history tell us about China's capabilities? Well, if you go back to the grandfather of science historians, Joseph Needham, catalog this whole thing in science and civilization in China, his masterwork, he found that China had an amazing record, 256 inventions, important inventions, at a rate of 15 inventions per century, for over 15 centuries, was the rate that he clocked, which he said was unprecedented. But after that, what happened? The scientific revolution did not happen in China. It happened in medieval Europe. And Needham points out two factors why it didn't happen in China. One, what he called bureaucratic feudalism. And the second was the absence of a merchant class with venture capital. So having said that, let's take a leap to the present. How is China's governance of science and technology organized today? Well, to start with, China has a 60-year-old tradition of supporting science and technology at the very apex level, starting from Chuan Lai's four modernizations, science was the fourth. And then, of course, a succession of five-year plans, other programs, uh, fronted by the top Communist Party leadership, have driven science and technology forward um, with increasing investment, increasing effort, building of talent, building of institutions, building of cadres, uh, creating international linkages, research institutions, many, many others. I think the story is well known. I won't belabor this point uh, too much. Um, as a result of that, you have what really looks like a very strong structure, which is uh, at the apex level, the Chinese Academy of Sciences, the 120 institutes, uh, leading universities of whom no less than 12 are today in the top 100 in the world. Tsinghua is an example and several others. Um, you have private sector research and public sector research complementing each other, along with finance capital and venture capital. So Needham's second point is taken care of. You have a string of other research institutions. Um, you have coordinating mechanisms because the party, as my colleagues explained earlier, is a very strong coordinating mechanisms. And the result of all this uh, has been quite evident, uh, primarily in the area of technology. We saw an example just a few days ago of the Mars rover and the Mars landing. Um, and many other technological feats. But also, let us remember in recent years, in the sciences, in fact, in some fields like genomics, uh, in terms of facial recognition, artificial intelligence, uh, green energy, uh, China is recognized to be one of the leaders even in pure science. Um, so these are very strong foundations which China has built in terms of the governance of science and it seems to be paying very good results. But, and there is a but, but is this enough? It has been enough so far, but is it enough to meet the challenge of the, of the higher productivity that is going to be required? if the rich versus old dilemma is to be solved. Now, there we come to another modern 
academic inquirer, Professor Yashan Wang of MIT, who has followed Needham's footsteps after several decades in investigating this matter, and he touches upon the role of bureaucracy, the first of the issues that Needham mentioned. What Yashan does is he looks at these 256 uh, innovations that China invented, and he x-rays them very carefully. And he finds a very interesting pattern. What he finds is that before the Yuan dynasty, roughly 13th century, before the Yuan dynasty, the rate of inventions uh, of, of, from China was very high. After the Yuan dynasty, the rate fell sharp. Why did this happen? Professor Yashin's book, which is, he's still writing it, hasn't come out, is titled The Rise of the East. But East is not East as in direction, it's an acronym EAST. E uh, uh, is for education, A is for uh, authoritarianism, S is for stability, and T is for technology. And what he says is that the Chinese bureaucracy from early days, and he considers it a continuum, whether it is the imperial bureaucracy or the Marxist bureaucracy, the names may change, but he considers the fundamental nature of the Chinese bureaucracy to be an imperial bureaucracy. So he says the bureaucracy in China has got these four trends, education and examination based, authoritarian, seek stability, and uh, amplifies technology. So why did this happen, this divide at the Yuan dynasty? He says there is a very interesting difference, pre and post. The difference is that the bureaucracy pre-Yuan was much looser, more, uh, China was more diverse, China was somewhat more chaotic. Post Yuan, China was more stable, the empires grew bigger, uh, but China was less creative. And I would like to add one more element there from Angus Madison, the economic historian, who says China reached its peak of prosperity just before the Opium Wars, around the end of uh, Chen Long's reign, around the year 1800. Having two minutes now, please. Yes, I'm near the end. So, what Yashin is saying is that these elements are an internal contradiction. Creativity and stability. The more you follow stability, the less you focus on creativity. The more creativity you have, you will have to tolerate a little more instability uh, and disruption. And I would like to add the third element of prosperity. So can you have, because what we are aiming at now is creativity leading to prosperity, as I started. So can these three elements, creativity, prosperity, and stability coexist? It is like impossibility theorem in economics or the three-body problem in physics. He says, Yashin says, no, it, they cannot coexist. Something has to give. So if you go after stability, you will have to sacrifice creativity and prosperity and vice versa. Now, is his hypothesis going to work out? Is this, is this the state that and the problem that China will face? I don't have an answer right now. This is the state of the research as it stands. So I will close leaving that question in your mind. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, that was very lucid and uh, posed a number of very concrete issues. Um, I'm going to talk, friends, uh, briefly about China's method of using leading small groups. 
No other country has a similar mechanism. And this is really quite interesting. The notion of a leading small group goes back to the Yan'an days, to the very early days of the Chinese revolution, uh, when groups of three people were appointed to track and decide on issues, come up with recommendations for a final decision by the higher leadership. Leading small groups exist in sizable numbers. The best estimates published uh, by researchers are in the region of 50. Uh, there is a list that uh, even lists some 80 plus, but some of those uh, leading groups have kind of um, perhaps become dormant. So what is a leading small group? It is typically headed by a member of the Politburo very often by a member of the standing committee of the Politburo, that is the top seven leaders, and a number of major leading small groups are personally headed by Xi Jinping. Leading, uh, leading small groups, uh, the name is a misnomer, really. It's a very confusing name. Uh, the word leading should be replaced by leadership, uh, in my view, uh, Ling Dao, also means leadership, but uh, be as it may. They take up specific issues, they come up with recommendations, and they take policy decisions, which are perhaps in many cases affirmed by the Politburo. They cut across ministries and channels. The membership of a leading small group is never published, but they clearly include people from the party and the state. And of course, the PLA, as you know, the PLA is under the party, not under the state at all. Again, a very unusual Chinese structure. So the leading small groups work through their offices. Um, each one has an office of its own. They keep track of schedules, they um, uh, keep track of recommendations, they handle uh, some of the paperwork, but also presumably they throw up ideas. A very fine study on the functioning of leading small groups is in a CIPRI paper, Stockholm Peace Research Institute paper of 2010, that looked at what was then the leading small group on foreign affairs. Now that leading small group has now been folded up into the new Central Commission on Foreign Affairs established in March 2018. Now, China doesn't innovate frequently with institutions. And that major administrative reorganization of March 2018 uh, is perhaps a hugely understudied subject. It needs greater examination but be as it may. Leading small groups don't manage to resolve all rivalries or problems of uh, mutual um, disharmony between agencies. And I know this from my study of the working of the diplomatic system, the a long standing rivalry between the foreign ministry and the commerce ministry uh, resulted in the creation of this Foreign Affairs Commission. Uh, why the rivalry? Because the Commerce Ministry in China handles all economic issues, including aid, including financing of all kinds of external activities. Now you can imagine that is bound to create problems. You cannot today separate politics from economics uh, within your country or outside, uh, be as it may. The leading small groups um, take decisions which are then ratified at another level. They are task oriented. They bring in people from outside the state structure. They bring in professors, they bring in advisors. But again, as I said, we don't know the exact membership of the uh, LSGs as they are called. Uh, 
have the leading small groups been used in recent years to centralize authority in the hands of President Xi Jinping? That was a conclusion offered by The Economist, which wrote a whole article on these leading small groups. It's worth reading if you can lay hands on it. Uh, this method is not widely studied uh, because it is opaque. Uh, we really don't know very much about them, but it is something that is worth much deeper examination. And I'll stop here. Uh, we've taken up 40 minutes so far with the initial presentations. Uh, I was particularly struck by the uh, comprehensiveness of what Ravi had to say and the ideas thrown up by both Ritu and Beam, which suggested that they are really in the midst of working on more detailed studies of their own, which they plan to publish, and those will be very interesting. But I would ask both Ritu and Bhim initially to perhaps comment on how the Chinese county system and the Chinese method of the party cadres and the leading cadres, etc., how that very briefly compares with an Indian system. In India, we have districts, which are also in charge of the totality of administration, delivery of development programs, etc. So, Ritu, is there any comparison of this kind that is at all possible if you have studied this? And being, uh, how would the Chinese method of administration and uh, perhaps also uh, the uh, training academies compare with India's? Over to both of you. Ritu first and then Bhim. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. This is a very interesting, uh, you know, query. Uh, I mean, I mean, one, one can write an entire, look into entire this, you know, Panama box, what is happening in the district level in India. But when I was looking at the, you know, uh, this, the data and the material on county level, I was so surprised to see everything is so well documented and in the, in the county level websites. I don't know whether we do the same thing at the district level in India. Second thing, which I was very surprised to know that, uh, you know, how uh, not only well documentation, uh, but also you have the full details of their uh, land use plan, their complete planning, as well as the new method of transparency, which this kind of government has been focusing systematically. So even if the communist government, in, in the sense, you know, the one way to uh, a kind of response to this or a uh, reaction or what you can say, solving this authoritarian resilience is, I think, uh, through this very much interactive process through the social uh, grassroots people in the common people in the science, because during my visit itself, I saw a complete office dedicated to this transparency where you have all the photographs of the county officials, township officials, and then you have a right to complain and go into social media, talking about the problems in their localities and all. So Thank I... I think yeah. that's a very important point you made, which yeah, is yeah. that at the county level, there is a strong effort made to demonstrate transparency and accountability. And you mentioned about complaints about social media, and you affirm what is also known that at the county levels, Officials who are misusing authority can be named, they can be attacked, and all that is permissible because that does not question the authority of the party as such. Uh, I think you would agree with me on that. Uh, Bhim, would you like to comment on uh, uh, how this compares with the Indian system? I mean, obviously, it's entirely different. Uh, thank you, sir, for that query. Uh, yeah, definitely, like, if you have to see, and having grown up... Uh, in, in the border lands of India and frontier. I could say a lot of, in, in the Indian case, if I have to say, a lot of uh, prospective IAS officers came and came, used to come and visit our villages there. And like was in China, we do have, uh, they do have that uh, patient, like mid-career training when a prospective candidate or a cadre is getting promoted to a different level. They do have mid-career training 
and as well as uh, uh, you know other orientation programs in different parts of the country however uh, one of the difficulty that really if we see in today's xi jinping period today in china is that will such a party oriented bureaucracy led by cadres will that continue for you know infinite time for how long will it continue will it also is is he going to really a uh, reorient uh, chinese bureaucracy or so to say the cadre system cadre management system into as that of india's territorial administrative system based on you know not controlled by the by the central organization department where uh, the cod controls the leading cadres in the country but whereas the accountability by or, or with regard to the provinces as well so will that continue i think that becomes uh, that has become and it will i think become one of the important uh, challenges for xi jinping for the, for really stabilize uh, his administration so to say future uh, party administration in china will that happen so but definitely training wise school wise today uh, as i was preparing for this lecture i was uh, really checking on what are the syllabuses are you know like in india because of the pandemic we are having online classes even the cadres are having e governance online classes there so uh, they do have different syllabuses there and definitely in every county as professor uh, agarwal has already mentioned they have their own websites functioning subjects being taught and different uh, you know basket of uh, and different teachers as well yeah thank you sir. thank you very much veen ravi um, would you uh, like to compare the chinese method uh, even if it is not so easy with the indian practice of managing science and technology affairs uh, what is it where are we so different uh, from the chinese but well, i think uh, thank you chu uh, to put it very very quickly um i think there are two aspects one is the strong and continued commitment from the top levels to science and technology which uh, as i said from the four modernizations has only been increasing uh, one can see visible signs of this with the higher number of technocrats that china has had in the top leadership uh, and their movement uh, through the ranks right up to uh, very very senior levels that is one index of the importance that is given to science and technology the second are all the measurable quantifiable data the r&d expenditure per capita r&d growth establishment of institutions the sheer numbers in terms of talent and so on uh, india has of course done a lot if we look at our 50 to 60 years but uh, as you said if you compare them the gap has only grown wider it has not narrowed it has grown wider so uh, the the chinese system therefore today is capable of a response in a huge scale something they demonstrated uh, during covid for example or pollution control air pollution control for example that is their uh, one of the things that system can do there are several other things that are more questionable in that system i pointed out some during uh, my talk um, uh, where i think india has an edge and that is where science interfaces with ethics and interfaces with social consequences uh there i think china has had a problem to take the great leap forward uh, for one to take the one child policy which did cut population but the gender implications the demographic impl implications were not for true so the indian system with whatever chaos there is does provide a rough balance in, in these things uh, in checks and balances to science policy thank you thank you i think that's a very important and we are now in the happy situation of having this policy in one gesture it is coming up for the danger i want to particularly invite younger members of the audience um, you 
my friends will have priority at least for the first five or six questions. So anyone under 35 is um, uh, sincerely requested to please come up with your questions. I see that my friend Ambassador Suresh, who is, uh, shall we say, a perennial, uh, has a question. But I know Suresh will be uh, glad to wait for a few minutes if younger people have questions. But we'll first begin with um, Solly Benjamin, who has a question for Ritu. Solly, please. Suresh, please wait for a moment, if you don't mind. Thank you. Solly? Can we... Uh, yes, uh, hello. Yes. Uh, I thought if you want to give an uh, opportunity to younger people, because no, no, I just uh, turned you, you, you 60. Start, so. uh, others will come up in a minute. <laughs> okay. The first. Uh, yeah, th thank you very much for an uh, excellent set of presentations and um, uh, and were also very timely. Uh, the question to uh, Ritu was that uh, she had mentioned that uh, uh, the, the county also have uh, powers by the state to expand beyond their jurisdictional boundaries. So if she could tell us a little bit more about that. And there's also a second question, but only if there's time. Uh, a, a kind of emphasis on urbanization beyond large metro cities and emerging provinces. So is this move to empower the county's administration, especially on industrialization, urban renewal, part of that? And what happens about migrant workers on the Huku status? Thank you very much. Ritu, please. I think Professor Benjamin himself has uh, done a you know good amount of field work on China, and I know that you know in a conference in Bangalore he was they were presenting with this uh, uh, co co researcher. So one has to learn more from him. But what comes to um, uh, you know in a way to respond to immediately what comes to my mind about his questions, uh, this entire. Uh, you know, the whole idea of that, how one understand this urbanization and uh, the whole issue which was brought forward by a few scholars was that it is more than, uh, it's, it's actually restructuring of state power through the territorial expansion. So, which means that you, act, it's all about annexing the counties and take, and the provinces, the provinces actually uh, and uh, expand the scope of municipality. Something which happened in the Changkung uh, case, that's why I was showing the photograph, that how in the phase of urban restructuring, they have uh, changed the villages to towns, and then uh, some town, earlier the towns into neighborhood committee. So that's how they make a kind of a administrative boundaries, re redraw the administrative boundaries. In a way, you are right to give them more power in terms of getting the financial uh, uh, jurisdiction, give them more kind of a, as I said, flexible, a creative financing and which they can use in terms of building industrial park or getting more kind of funding by investing, getting investment from the outside sources, as well as in terms of, but they have to make promises with the urban restructuring as well as the rural uh, development. And that's what the county is actually, uh, you know, trying to balance with. So in that sense, in the rural areas also, they have made a kind of a supply and marketing cooperatives so that the prices can be controlled and it doesn't go beyond the regulation. That's what I mean to say by socialist uh, regulation, which is also present in the county level governance. So, uh, you know, is urbanization, which I basically worked on this hinterland county in the Yunnan province, which has not been uh, urbanized at such a large scale as Professor Mohanty, I'm sure uh, has a lot to say on this about, you know, his own field work in uh, Wuxi. But um, as far as I'm concerned in Yunnan, what has led to a, you know, not building up of big metropolitan cities, it has not happened in case of Yunnan at least, rather building up of a small cities as well as towns. And that become a feature of the uh, urbanization in the Changku County. So thank there's a lot much, we can, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Uh, thank you, Ritu. Uh, I don't see any young scholar who has uh, uh, hitherto expressed a wish to come into the conversation. Uh, maybe I can request uh, young Arpita, who is present and who is uh, just starting an internship with the Institute of Chinese Studies. Um, she is uh, going to, um, shall we say, suffer me for the next couple of months as a guide. So maybe I can request Arpita to come forward and ask a question. But while she thinks up an issue that she would 
perhaps like to raise. Uh, Ambassador Suresh Goel, please, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, sir, Ambassador Rana. For a moment, I was delighted when you counted me under 35. Uh -huh. I, I did want to become young once again, but well, that is not to be. Uh, my, I have two questions or thoughts, whichever way you may treat it. And one of them is addressed to both Ritu and uh, Bhim, and the other to Ravi. Ravi actually caught my interest by mentioning the three body problem in physics, but I'll come to that in a moment. Uh, you see, uh, it's all right to say that the county administration would have certain independence, certain powers which they can exercise on their own in their own areas. Uh, but from my own experience, when I was in China, that was far, far too long ago. Uh, I was there from 1988 to 91. So now you know that I'm really ancient. But at that time also, there was a system for party control over the county administration. Now, my question really is, there is no way I think that the central committee can give up their control over the county party cadre. How is that control exercised in relation to the administrative liberties or latitude that they are given? Uh, what is the process for uh, pulling up somebody if they actually go beyond the party discipline? That is number one to both Bhim and uh, Ritu. And Ravi, uh, three body problem is not all that unsolvable. I was just basically, I'm a physics graduate and therefore I was just going over the data. There was a mathematician who found a solution to the problem in 1912. His name was Professor Carl Sunman, Finnish chap. So I think even in China, they have found their own innovative solution to the three body problem of uh, creativity, stability, and the prosperity. By dividing the politics and the economics into two completely uh, distinct compartment, uh, where you can have creativity, you can prosper, but dare you not encroach into what the party is, where the party is sacrosanct in terms of their own affairs. Do you think, given the kind of the current economic prosperity in China, there would ever be a time when the party would try and give up or relax its control? over the political systems. Thank you, sir. Ritu, please. And then we- I think uh, very fascinating, uh, you know, actually the whole issue, um, I was reading another day because, you know, Prof. Ambassador Rana has really made a very interesting theme and I was looking at some readings and I came across a leading group even happening in county level where the county level, especially in the recent years, have been asked to carry forward and implement the policy of Xi Jinping's poverty elevation program. And there, there was a clear indication in that field work in that county level that how uh, the central government is making a kind of a, you know, important intervention by uniting, making a kind of a command forces, as they call it, government, party, army, and, uh, uh, you know, enterprises together so that it can work together to implement the poverty elevation program. So in that case, it was an interference from the central government, which county government had to adjust. But in the earlier time, since county government has been, you know, under the fiscal decentralization, since there was a budgetary revenues and the extra budgetary revenues. So budgetary revenues is something which has been fixed by the provincial government, which they have to give to them. Extra budgetary revenues are something which they have to create on their own. So in that case, they are giving the freedom in this category to do whatever they want to believe in. And they were fascinated with this idea of prosperity for all. But of course, the prosperity for all limited later on, limited to a certain sections only. So this is the, you know, the fixed category and the adjusted category. This is where they make a balance between that. Beam, would you like to come in? Yes, uh, uh, Ambassador Gul, thank you for your query and just to, uh, 
uh, after i think adding on to what professor agarwal has said so my uh, assessment or in my opinion and my reading of uh, you know as you said that will the communist party china or the central committee will really give up administration at the county level i think uh, i think that is a obvious uh, there, there is an obvious answer there would be no and uh, and xi jinping definitely if you see the role of the party coming to the center again that is the politics in command i don't think so that is going to happen however there are some structural challenges within the chinese civil service and the cadre uh, management system where uh, there has to be some uh, you know uh, kind of a reforms again restructuring or so to say reforms again reforms not as per the western uh, britain woods uh, you know system but uh, within the chinese setup how uh, will the, will china really or will xi jinping's administration really look into territorial uh, you know reforms of of de of decentralization not politically but administratively definitely with giving more uh, fiscal freedom than politics i think so then i'll rest here thank you Uh, Kishan, shall I answer please, some questions? Please. Oh. Thank so you. Thank, thank you, Ravi. Thank you very much uh, uh, for, firstly, your observation on the three-body problem. I think you're far more up to date on physics uh, than I am. Uh, but I was very interested by a science fiction work by Tsushi Lin, which is titled The Three-Body Problem. It's a trilogy. Actually, I would recommend it to you. Yeah, uh, uh, since you like this subject. But essentially, that is a very complicated problem. Uh, and you're right, that China has found its own solution. But so far, and so far, remember, the journey has been driven more by technology. It has been rapid development and deployment of technology uh, that has driven China fast. Although, as I mentioned, there are some areas where China is now in the leading edge in science. But going forward, what is going to drive the productivity is China's discoveries in basic science and new scientific principles. Because if you are at the leading edge, you can only move through science because that is what gives rise to technology. Now, that means asking a lot of questions. And a lot of the people who ask those questions can be angular individuals who may ask awkward questions which may start running across the party guidelines. Somewhat like uh, Tofim Lysenko uh, at, in the Soviet Union, his theories were completely against Mendelian laws, yet the Soviet Union supported him and landed in disaster. So uh, uh, there are these issues where you have scientific discovery you will have ethical issues, you will have social issues, which are political matters. So if a scientist raises that, politician can say, well, you're intruding in our territory. And the, the frontiers are very difficult to disentangle. And this may be the area that the state finds difficult. I don't for a moment believe uh, that they will let go, as you say, uh, or democratize or anything like that. Uh, but in my paper, I'm now grappling with this concept. It sounds absurd. But can there be something like authoritarian creativity? Can there be a state where you can manage creativity but still keep control? Maybe not to the exact extent as of today, but with this limited amount of relaxation something like the Mao era and then the Deng era, for example. It's not that Deng let, let everything go, no. So is there something, and that will be a social innovation for China, if it can negotiate something like an authoritarian creativity? That's the point I am here in this study, and I, I, I'm encouraged by your question to explore it further. Thank you. Thank you very much, Raj. Suresh, if I may add a comment to you, that, you know, you asked whether party control over the state system will get weaker. If anything, 
under Xi Jinping, that control has got stronger. And if uh, one is to go by today's indications, it seems unlikely. But who knows what may happen the day after tomorrow. Uh, Arpita has a question. May I just add one sentence? I'm sorry, I beg your intentions. What Ravi said reminded me of Elder Huxley, Brave New World, which is all about authoritarian creativity. You create artificial intelligence androids who basically do your bidding. So maybe that is an example or that is a model that China may probably want to follow. Thank you very much, sir. That's all. Thank you, Suresh. Arpita, would you like to come in and put your question and you put it on the chat, but uh, maybe you'd like to uh, uh, raise it directly with Ravi. Can you unmute, unmute yourself, please? I'll just read out what I've written in the judge box. Is that one of the major... And this is uh, something that I would like to... Uh, Arpita, we can't hear you. Oh. Okay. Um, I will read out your question then. One of the major technologies that the Chinese state has fostered is artificial intelligence, facial technology and associated surveillance. And this seems to me to be an effort towards social control and stability uh, as seen with the implementation of the social credit system. What can be the implications of this for Chinese societies in terms of the balance that Mr. Bhutalingam has talked about, stability, prosperity, and creativity? Are you likely to see a decrease in dissenting, dissenting opinion? Ravi, uh, me, uh, well, uh, you know, uh, Arpita, all technologies have good and bad uses. Uh, for example, credit card verification, normally practiced everywhere in the world, is a form of social credit. Because if you don't have a good record, you don't get uh, uh, loans. So China has carried this logically to a different level. Now, facial recognition can be used for a lot of good things like traffic control and so on and so forth. It can also be used uh, for surveillance, as you rightly say. And this is where the distinction between social and ethical use and uh, uh, scientific uh, possibility becomes very important. And this is where there can be a debate. But how much of that debate will be possible? This is the crucial question. Uh, now, uh, if one looks at the history of China, I think this will come in sort of ebbs and waves. Uh, I don't think from the Xi Jinping era we, should, we can extrapolate that China will forever be in this condition. After all, in 1976, who could have foreseen Deng Xiaoping? Similarly, uh, in Deng Xiaoping's era, who could have foreseen there would have been Xi Jinping later? So. Uh, there is a cyclical pattern in China, and maybe this is what will happen. You will have tight control, then you will have some sort of resistance. After all, air pollution was public resistance. There was uproar, and the party had to pay attention to that, otherwise they felt stability would be uh, compromised. It's not that the party is unthinking, they're quite, they're quite conscious about it. Uh, they, some, they have to draw a line. Sometimes they get it right. Sometimes they get it wrong. So it is very much clear, Jeff. Thank you, Ravi. Uh, Rajiv Kumar has a question. There was somebody else who had a, a raised hand, but uh, that has disappeared. I'm sorry if that person could not wait. Rajiv, you have the floor. Rajiv Kumar, please. Hello. Rajiv, please come in. Am I audible, sir? Yes, you are. Uh, these days, I am reading a book named uh, Ancient Chinese Thought and Modern Chinese Power by Yon, uh, Yan Fetong. So, I found two comments uh, important and it is in line with what, uh, what Bhim sir was saying that uh, according to Joseph Stalin, Cadus determined everything. And uh, according to Mao Zedong, once the political line is determined, the cadres are the decisive factor. So this, this is not my question, this was just a comment. What I wanted to ask, given the effectiveness of China's system of governance, don't you think it is providing, uh, a, providing an alternative system of governance 
to the developing countries because somewhere in the book yan fritong has suggested that if china wants to become great or uh, uh, to be precise a human authority it should must be not only reduce the power gap with united states but also to provide a better model for the society to the developing country so my question is to ritu ma'am and uh, uh, to some extent dean sir so do you think it is providing a better system of governance to developing countries including india because many scholar including india suggested to adopt that system of government but uh, once professor yang yao uh, who is a professor at peking university uh, so it would not be possible so i wanted to know your thank you time. thank you uh, uh, perhaps beam be respond first before we go to ritu beam ah uh, thank you uh, for that query uh, in fact uh, my reading of yang shuideng was in a different scale but i wasn't really uh, you know uh, looking into that will china model uh, you know help other countries uh, will china's template work to other developing countries like us and even to, so to say to india uh, i think i don't think so because the, we only see the strengths of what china has really depicted and uh, it's uh, i think uh, professor uh, manoranjan mohanty's book a uh, china's transformation success trap and the success, sorry the success story and the success trap will really throw light on what china really has gone through to become such a superpower or economic superpower that is today uh, as as a student of political science and as a you know as i am studying china uh, no country can you know can really copy paste uh, others administrative system although some of the strengths we can really definitely adopt but at the same time we cannot really look into uh, or really go into overhauling of the system itself thank you thank you uh, ritu a brief response please yeah just just one point anyway bhim has already uh, said enough uh, just just one point adding to him uh, you know more than uh, administration and china especially the volunteerism the local level you know the volunteerism the local level organization volunteer associations networking that makes the administration you know successful so especially in the pandemic time when i was looking through you know some other resources local government and their response to pandemic the way the party secretary have been removed because they could not control the cases the way the people came forward to fight against the pandemic is actually tells a different story about china's governance that's it sir great thank you very uh, much sir can i just uh, suggest to the question oh. just one small uh, ICS had actually hosted one of the book release uh, by uh, Professor Prasenji Dwara and uh, uh, Professor Perry. I think that's beyond regimes. India, China, how different apart from these two different countries' political systems. But we share many of the issues like urbanization problems or population problems uh, with regard to even uh, ecology, environmental problems. So I think that uh, that book can really help. help us to and it is written by both the indian authors and and uh, based in jnu du and and also some scholars from the west i think that can throw a light on how uh, we converge on many of the problems ourselves despite having two different uh, administrative systems or political systems thank you okay thank you uh, prashant sahu has a question um, uh, please take the floor but keep it very very brief uh, i think we are getting close to our closing time Uh, we certainly don't want to step beyond um, um, twenty uh, minutes past four o'clock. So, Prashant, please come in. Okay, sir. So, uh, uh, regarding China's uh, changing environmental priorities, recently Xi Jinping has uh, set the goal for twenty thirty and twenty sixty two for uh, you know carbon emissions. Uh, uh, peak and carbon neutrality so how is this uh, target reflected in the science and technology administration and how feasible is this target to achieve by by Prashant, the time my small question to you would be can anyone really set a target 40 years down the road anyway ravi your response please okay thank you uh, prashant 
uh, well, environment is certainly a very key priority uh, for the Chinese uh, CCP. Uh, if you remember, Xi Jinping about a year and a half ago spoke of a beautiful country, to use his words, as the goal, one of the goals ahead. I already talked about uh, air pollution, uh, where uh, remarkable uh, progress has been achieved. But China is also a re leader in green energy, uh, as I mentioned. It is also a leader in electric cars, uh, in the use of solar uh, and wind. So there is a very, very strong, compelling force um, uh, behind this. And it's not just because uh, they are people with their hearts in the right place. Uh, they know that it matters to the Chinese people. I think this is the lesson that has gone home from the uh, air pollution story. And therefore, whether it is uh, burning coal or cutting forests or uh, lack of water, they know this can be a destabilizing situation. So they are very focused on it. Um, I, mean, I, know, I, know remains, I know also remains a leading force in, in the construction of coal fired uh, power plants. Yes, it does. That's also a reality. It is a reality. Quite of all its stake. Yes. It has got a huge legacy of coal. I mean, it oh, was. And it's building new ones. And it is building new ones with the so called clean coal. Now, what you and I don't know how clean that coal is, but it is a so called new technology. But I, I think the direction they are going is right. Now, as you say, so, whether they will reach it, whether they will not, is a, a different question. But there is no doubt that it is a key priority for the government and they have accepted quite tough targets. I think that Yaman has put a big issue in the chat. It is that unlike in the past, Yaman is now coming forward to present itself as a model for others, uh, that others can emulate it and it's even training um, civil uh, public security forces of different countries in its own very, very intrusive, very, shall we say, um, snoopy kind of technology. Uh, yes, that is happening. But the simple fact is that the environment within which the Chinese system operates is sui generis. There is no other comparable example. The nearest possible comparison could be to Vietnam, but Vietnam operates in a much more relaxed and open fashion, although it is a single party state, party run system, etc. This goes back to a point that Suresh had raised. Would China give up party control over the state system? As per present indication, that seems unlikely in this regime, its way of thinking. We cannot look into the future and, and predict what may or may not happen um, uh, five or 15 years down the road. Uh, I think we should end here um, within time and also perhaps leaving a few questions that are unanswered in people's minds, in people's uh, uh, thinking, because after all, the purpose of a seminar discussion like this is really to provoke thinking. It's not that any one of us has real answers or knows everything. Uh, I'm sure my colleagues on this panel would agree that we do not pretend at all to know everything or even most of the things. We are also all groping in the dark. But there is a sense of inquiry and a sense of curiosity with which we should approach these issues. Um, so with your permission, um, if uh, Ravi, Deen and Ritu agree with me, we will bring this session to a close as an interesting discussion, which has drawn far better participation than I had initially expected. I thank you all very, very much because a seminar is nothing 
without its audience. We four of us can sit and chat away as long as we like, but it is really the interaction with people and the possibility that we might be leaving all of you with some ideas that you may wish to reflect on. And for sure, I know I speak for Ravi, Bhim and Ritu that we will certainly um, get some further impetus in the kind of work that we are trying to do on China's domestic governance. Thank you very much. My warm thanks to the Institute, uh, to Ashok, to all the people who work behind the scene and who make such seminars possible. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you and goodbye.